All right, let's get started. Well, welcome everyone uh, to the kickoff of our RefSum webinar series. I'm Christy DeMarco. I'm the founder and president of Global Dare Foundation. Uh, I'll be your host today. Uh, I'm excited to have such a great turnout for today. We've uh, got si over 60 people registered for today. Uh, now let's go over the agenda. Uh, so I'll be kicking off uh, uh, the webinar with a few housekeeping details in reviewing our mission at Global Dare Foundation. I'll then be handing it over to Professor, Professor Anthony Wersbicki, PhD, from Guy's in St. Thomas Hospital in London. He'll be providing a clinical overview of Refsum's disease. Following his presentation, we'll begin a question and answer portion of the webinar. Now onto the housekeeping details. All the participants are in listen-only mode. Uh, there'll be a few ways that you'll be able to ask questions. Uh, participants uh, following on Zoom can type their questions in the Q&A box within the toolbar at any time during the presentation. So feel free to start asking your questions as soon as Anthony gets started presenting. Uh, and you're also able to raise your hand uh, by either pressing Alt plus the Y button on your keyboard or by clicking on the toolbar, uh, the, the hand, hand icon on the toolbar in Zoom. If participants are joining by phone, you can press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. For those that are raising their hand, we'll unmute them uh, at the time of those questions so they can ask their questions live. After the presentation, I'll be moderating the questions and we'll start with the Q&A box in Zoom, then the dial-in participants, and then the online participants. Today's session will be recorded uh, for later viewing at our Global Dare website. Global Dare Foundation was uh, established in October 2019. Dare stands for Defeat Adult Refsum Everywhere. Our mission is to promote worldwide awareness and better quality of life for those diagnosed with adult Refsum's disease. Our goal is to support research, education initiatives, awareness campaigns, and advocacy. Driving research is at the center of what we do because we dare to believe in a cure for Refsum's disease. Now I'll be handing it off to Anthony Wersbicki uh, from the guys in St. Thomas Hospital in London to present on the clinical overview of Refsum's disease. Over to you, Anthony. Thank you very much, Christy. Um, I'm sort of here to sort of represent um, a long-standing clinical interest that we have had now at Guys and Thomas's Hospitals, but previously uh, when we were at the Westminster and then Chelsea Westminster Hospitals in Refsum disease that dates back almost 40 years now. And what I'm going to try and do in the next 30 minutes or so is to take you through what the disease is, how it relates to the various bits of cells and the diet and how we try and manage it. There are going to be future webinars in this series which will go into more detail on the science and the diet and the, and the eye aspects of disease. So I'm only going to cover those in the most sort of general sense. So to begin with, what is Refsum disease and why, where do we actually fit it in? It's a peroxisome disease. Most people have not heard of peroxisomes. These are essentially small batteries inside cells, but they're semi-failed batteries. They're very, very ancient. They have lost half their functions. And what they do these days is that they deal with any fatty acid that is complex. So most fatty acids that you find in fats in food are nice straight chains and be, can be chopped up in or made by adding two carbon units. And that's the basis really of fat metabolism. The problem comes when you actually introduce kinks into those fatty acids by putting a double bond in, or when you have something added to them. And it can either be a branch or a ring or something like that added to this. And those kind of fatty acids go into the peroxisome. And the peroxisomes are universal. They're very, very ancient. They go all the way back to, to fungi and to algae. And they have about 310 proteins 
some many of which are involved, some of which are involved in transporting uh, fatty acids in and out of them. They have about 150 enzymes, which are proteins that do specific functions to either add groups, change groups, or remove groups from those fatty acids and other molecules. So what they do, well, they're involved in something called beta oxidation. Beta oxidation is the technical term for removing two carbon units from a fatty acid. They also do another function, which is one retin relevant to retin disease, which is alpha oxidation, where you need to remove a single carbon unit. They can also add carbon units, and that's what they're doing, making very long chain fatty acids, which are found in myelin and in the fatty acid linings of nerves. They're involved in making cholesterol. They're involved in metabolizing other alcohols metabolizing the components of DNA and uh, molecules, and also in animals in vitamin tablets. That's where they make vitamin A, C, and E. And one of the distinguishing features about them is that people will say that they actually contain hydrogen peroxide, which is a very common agent in leeches. Um, they're one of the compartments in which the cell isolates hydrogen peroxide and bleach. And bleach has the same functions in the peroxone as it pretty much does in the general hub. So where, what do these look like? Next slide, please. They are little dots, and on the left-hand side in the uh, uh, graph, this you can see uh, a cell with a red nucleus, which is where the DNA sits, and these little speckles, and there are hundreds of them in the individual cell. As I say, they're a specialist compartment. They have their own import and export machinery, and that is relevant to what we actually do in residencies. There are disorders of these uh, peroxisomes where you can't make them, or you make them and they're disordered. And those are the peroxisomal biogenesis disorders. They mostly affect very young children and are quite devastating. In you know, and These are called peroxisomal biogenesis disorders. Next slide. They are the ones that are the most obvious manifestations, and they show up through the actions really of the fatty acids and the modified cholesterol like alcohols that are present. So, you can have features of neurological disease affecting the brain, affecting therefore walking, vision, uh, smell. You can have features that affect the skin because the skin uses a lot of complex fatty acids. They are also involved in things that regulate bone formation, so you tend to get bone abnormalities. And one of the peroxone biogenesis disorders, and they are relevant to refsums as some of them, as you find refsum disease in all of these, because it is a subgroup of them. So one set, there are two main protein pathways that take uh, proteins into peroxisomes. One's called the PTS pathway, and that is the more severe spectrum disease, the so-called infantile refsum disease, which is not adult refsum disease, though it's a different disorder, ranging up the cell later, typically in very, very young children, quite devastating. And then we have another group of disorders that affect about three or four proteins, which are, effect, which are, tran which are transported through the PTS2 pathway, and that's called RCDP, or rhizomatic chondrodysplasia. And then lastly, we have defects of the individual protein enzymes and transporters within the proctosome. And there are about 30 or 40 of these known, but people are always finding new ones. And Refsum disease is one of these single enzyme deficiency disorders. Next bit. So when did we actually begin to find out about Refsum disease? Well, it was first described in 1947 in Norway uh, by Sigis Bard Refsum, and was really described as a, as a disorder of eyes and of uh, gait with some obvious bony abnormalities. Phytanic acid, which is actually the causative phytanic acid, the thing that accumulates in this disease, was actually not found in 1953. It was actually found by the New Zealand uh, Milk Marketing Board as a component of cheap smoke. And it took about 15 years for this all to be put together. 
and only in 1967 was the idea of dietary treatment and removal of phytanic acid really thought about for rare disease. That was when people put the two and two together, that if you had Resin's disease, you tend to have elevated phytanic acid, that if you either took it out physically, it was something called plasmapheresis, or you restricted it through the diet, which is a well-known intervention for people with inherited metabolic disorders, you seem to make things better. Thereafter, it was a matter of trying to uh, identify where this came from, how it, where it arose from, how it was metabolized, and that's where it became aware, where it became known that it was in a subgroup of the proxosomal disorders. It was eventually localized there about 25 years ago. Uh, Ron van der Zee's group in Amsterdam were involved in the identification and cloning of the, of the enzyme. And, clarified, and then we were involved with Ron in identifying that there might be more than one type. And this is where the idea that we have the RCDP variant, the PTS2 import defect comes from. And then over the last 20 years, we found that there are, it's a third version, which is further down the path, like called MACR. And then most intriguingly, a disorder of very, very short chain carbon molecules called PHAR, which we don't quite know how it fits in, but clinically looks almost identical to Refson's disease. Next bit. So how common is Refson's disease? It's actually very rare. It's about one in a million. About 90% are due, they're all due to defects in the pathway for metabolizing phytanic acid, which is this acid that accumulates it. And most of them are actually due to the defects in the enzymes. 5% are these RCTB variants, which is actually that you cannot import the enzyme into the peroxisome. And if it sits outside, because it's in the wrong environment, it doesn't work. And that's one of the keys to it. About 3% are due to defects further down the pathway. But if you have a block at the bottom of the pathway, you gradually get buildup happening backwards through it. And if that buildup gets big enough, then you can begin to see the clinical symptoms and features of disorders higher up the pathway. And that's what happens with AMACR, that if it's severe enough, you do get phytanic acid levels going up, and that causes symptoms that are related to it. As I said, PHARC is a little bit uh, unclear, but we've only got two or three cases of it. And then there are some that we simply have all the clinical features, but we don't know what causes them. That's about one or two cases in the world. So what are the features of it? And this is really how it was actually originally described. The first thing that you see in Refson's disease is typically most people are fine until about the age of 10. But around the age of 10, people start having difficulties with vision. They tend to become, have a feature of night blindness. They lose vision at night while color vision is preserved. And that feature becomes more and more obvious as you can see from this graph so that virtually everybody has it by the age of 40. The other thing that tends to go with it, though it's a very subtle sign, is a lack of a sense of smell. Most people think of smell as um, being separate, different from taste, but in actual fact, it's, the two are very, very linked. So many people with Resident disease will describe food as very, very bland, or actually being able only to recognize the four major taste sensations, salt, sour, um, etc. If you have acute Refson's disease, you tend to get, as the, as the acid accumulates, it is soluble, it dissolves in fat, and so forth, therefore starts poisoning fatty tissues. So one of this is re re represents sort of poisoning in the nerves, for which you get a neuropathy, and that tends to occur in the longer nerves because those are the most subject to it, so you tend to get that effect in the hands and feet, and that's the so-called peripheral neuropathy. It mostly affects sensation, but it can affect motor functions to an extent. Later on, you begin to get deafness. That's a far slower phenomenon. It generally occurs about 20-odd years after you begin to see the onset of the eye changes, and it's gradual and not everybody gets it. That's a slow poisoning effect to the nerve cells that actually mediate uh, hearing sounds. And lastly, if you get a lot of phytanic acid occurring, 
because it dissolves in fatty tissues, it not only dissolves in the nerves and the fat, the other place that you have a lot of fat is in the skin, so you actually get deposition of it in the skin, and it causes a scale-like skin uh, rash called ichthyosis, which basically describes the large fish scale appearance of it. And that is most severe in early severe cases, and is probably the bit that resolves most quickly when you actually begin to take phytanic acid out of the system. But it can be quite florid. It's a very, very florid, large-scale eczema type reaction, but clinically different from eczema. Next, please. The eye changes are very, very obvious when you see them. One of the things that you begin to see is a tunneling of vision, especially at night, and that begins to tunnel to the center, and the center is where, of the eye, is where you have color vision, and that tends to be preserved until quite late. So as the cells are lost from the back of the eye, you begin to see exposure of the background of the eye. And the eye is a little bit like a dark room, so it has this dark background lining for the uh, retinal epithelium, behind the retinal epithelium, and you begin to see these black spots appearing, and that's what you can see in the pictures here, peripherally more than anything, and then gradually moving centrally. So that's the sort of so-called salt and pepper retinitis pigmentosa, the pigment referring to the background of retinitis to the fact that it's in the retina. The tunneling you can see in the uh, picture here, just showing just how much eventually the, the loss of peripheral vision, loss of night vision concentrates down onto the macula, which is, the, which is where color vision occurs. And that's the kind of picture that you see. Next, please. That puts refsums into the group of retinitis disorders. There are about 70 known. Um, but the peculiarity that actually led to the identification of refsums was two features. One was the weakness associated with the retinitis, which isn't a feature of most of the retin other, other RP syndromes. They tend to be associated simply with eye disease. The other feature was that you had abnormalities in bones. And this is most shown at the edges of the extremities. So you begin to have short fingers and toes. And as you can see in these two photographs, the thumbs are relatively short on the left and the fourth and fifth toes are quite shortened on the right. And that's a bone sign that you can see. That's the most obvious bone sign. But you do get abnormalities in various other positions, particularly at the growth plates in the long bones, where you tend to see a little bit of disorder. And that predisposes to later on arthritis. And that's a slightly accelerated arthritis changes that you see generally as a part of aging. Next bit. So to come back to the cause, well, it's phytanic acid. Phytanic acid comes from the green plants. It's the anchor that actually holds the chlorophyll rings that provide the basis of photosynthesis and the green color to plants in the structures that actually split uh, water. So the problem with it is, is that green plants are reprocessed by animals, particularly ruminants such as cows, sheep, goats. And so you can actually say that this is the reverge of revenge of a hamburger. Because without the phytanic acid, without the chlorophyll being reprocessed by ruminants to liberate the phytol and the bacteria in the gut of the animal, in this particular stomach of ruminants, actually taking the phytol alcohol and taking it up to phytanic acid, we wouldn't have a problem. So that's where it comes from. It is a fat, fatty acid that we see produced by, by ruminant bacteria. It's absorbed inside the animals, doesn't do them any harm, and accumulates in their fat and fat tissues. And one of the fats that animals secrete is milk, and therefore botanic acid is found in large quantities in ruminant milks, and also in their tissues. And the more steak you eat and the more grass fed it is, the more likely it is to have a high fat acid content. Next, please. Next slide, please. So that's why fatty acid it comes in in the diet, and then it goes into this pathway, which is just listed here in terms of 
the general features. Ron Butler's will go into it in a lot more detail. The basis of it is, is that the structure of phytanic acid stops it being easily digested. So it has to go through a special pathway. Normally, you'd beta oxidize, which is shortened in two carbon units from where the acid bit of, of the fatty acid is. But you can't do that here. That's blocked. So you have to actually change a group around that acid uh, component, and then you can shorten it. And that's what phytonalpha a hydroxylase, the first enzyme that does. It produces uh, basically an aldehyde, then split off the carbon uh, monoxide through, a, through carbon dioxide, the carbon to carbon dioxide, and then you take it down to a racinase, which is a way of straightening out the fatty acids, and then on down into the, into the batteries of the cells, the mitochondria, which actually use it just like any other fatty acid. Next, please. Next slide, please. The next slide should be should be up. Okay. Should the be. fatty acid is shown in diagrammatic form at the top. So at the left hand side, you can see something called, termed the alpha N, and that's got the O and the OH, and that's the carboxyl group of an acid. The next carbon you can see with the squiggly line is the blocking group. That stops it being cut at the two carbon point. So you can see that if you actually have the squig the the Z, the uh, the indentations, you can take it off in two carbon units from the left, provided that that blocking group wasn't present. The alternative is that you can see that there are also two carbon units on the other side of the fatty acid, the so-called omega end, and if you actually change that into an acid, you add the hydroxide and you add the oxygen group, you can actually chew the phytanic acid from the right-hand side and shorten it back. So those are the two processes. They're called alpha oxidation and omega oxidation. Alpha oxidation is the pathway that's damaged in Refsen's disease. It's the path that's an ancient pathway, the present bacteria, algae, plants, and animals. It's got potentially quite high capacity for dealing with this. It probably does other things as phytanic acid as well. The alternative pathway is called omega oxidation. It starts from the other end. It's located in a different part of the cell, in a different compartment. It uses things called cytochromes, which are enzymes that add oxygen. They're mostly involved in drug metabolism, but can also be involved in metabolizing fatty acids, etc. That's got a very high capacity, very small capacity usually, but it's highly inducible. So those are the two pathways. Most phytonic acid usually in people without a defect goes to alpha oxidation. In people with Refsen's disease, where that pathway is reduced or absent, then they have to rely on omega oxidation. Next, please. So what does the enzyme look like? Well, like most enzymes, it relies on bringing the things required to change to metabolize phytanic acid into close proximity. So the phytanic acid is bound to a carrier protein, and the group that you want to attack sticks out from an end. That's the protein called SCP2. That is brought into a groove in the enzyme, which is actually, if you look on the side, is roughly located sort of north e um, northeast to southwest, and that's where it would sit. In the ring, you can see that there's a five-membered ring to the bottom of that little groove, and that's where the other portion binds. So you need to actually, to, because you add using oxygen to degrade the phytanic acid, you need to have an oxygen donor, and that's something called 2-oxyglutarate. That binds there. The oxygen is taken off and bound to a histidine residue, so the HXD motif, which is typical of one of these enzymes called oxygenases, of which uh, phytanol-CoA is involved. And what happens is that the oxygen is sifted off 2-oxyglutarate, bound to the HXD, and then used to attack the carbon atom that you want to oxidize up to actually cleave it to metabolize phytanic acid. And virtually all the defects that we know are involved in Refsen's disease usually affect the 2 glutabinding site, 
the HXD motif, that is the oxygen binding site, or bits around those key grooves. Otherwise, you have a, the other kind of retinases, about 20% of people just lack as many proteins are assembled like Lego by adding sequential bits. If you add one bit of the Lego stack, you miss one little Lego stack, the rest won't work. And those are so-called insertion and deletions, and those are the other cause of about 20%. Next, please. So that gives us onto, takes us a little bit more onto reference disease itself. So we have the classical reference disease where the pathway is absent due to damage to the phytanic, phytanol coating hydroxylase or phyh as it is abbreviated. If, since you need oxygen in an oxidizing environment, if that enzyme isn't located properly, i.e. can't get into the proxisome, it doesn't work and you'll get a copy or so-called phenocopy, an identical clinical presentation for different reasons, and that's the proxone of PTS, PTS, proxone biogenesis disorders, the same with PTS2, and because they're both lacking in, this, in the Zellweger spectrum disorders, PTS1 and 2. You can have a failure further down the pathway, as I showed a couple of slides ago, and that can backfail, giving you high levels of vitamic acid and the, and the causes of accumulation. I said PHARC is the other one, but we don't know quite what's happening there. Next, please. Next slide, please. So this is rhizomelic chondrophilia, RCDP for short. This is the defect where you can't import uh, the phytonyl coa hydroxylase and throw three other enzymes into the peroxide. It presents in children. It's linked to like Zellweger disease with severe mental problems, growth problems, cataract, lots of calcifications in um, birth. But there are also minor, more minor versions. Because the transporter has different affinities for the different things it transports, reference and by age is caused by the mildest version because you cannot actually take up by age because that has the weakest binding to the transporter. And that's why we get a reference like syndrome with, uh, in some cases with rhizomatic on the displays. Next, please. So this is the import pathway, just showing that diagrammatically that you have PTS2 proteins on the left, the so-called PEP7, and that's where the defects are in rhizomelium, and they go into that cluster of proteins in the middle, which is the huge transport complex. Next, please. Next slide, please. I think you might just have a delay on your side, Anthony. Yeah, yeah. So the, la the second disorder is the, the next group of disorders is the ones further down the pathway. And that's, uh, as you can see, AMACR is a little bit further down from phi, from phi H and alpha oxidation. And that gives you many of the same features. So you get the retinitis, the cataract, which also occur in Refson disease. You can get a, a leukodystrophy, that's abnormal facts in the brain, which can be imaged may or may not have clinical consequences. You get difficulties in walking, ataxia, but you also, for this disorder, get defects of bile acids, and so jaundice, or large liver, and that's the other function of the enzyme. So here you have a mixture of two kind of clinical syndromes, one a Refsum-like syndrome, but slightly more, uh, but also a bile acid disorder, and you put the two together, and you get the final version. Next, please. So, PHARC is the new one. It's something called diacylglyceride lyase deficiency, ALDH10 deficiency. It seems to affect something called anandamide and to be involved in the metabolism of arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is a very interesting molecule. It is involved in a whole load of neurological control processes. It is one of the keys to prostaglandins and 
um, the target of aspirin. So why this should actually give you a syndrome that looks very much like Rettin's disease, we don't know, because none of the enzymes that we classically think of with dealing with phytanic acid should affect a short chain molecule looking in anandamide. Though if you twist arachidonic acid a bit, it does look a little bit like phytanic acid. So is this a feature of it? We don't know, basically. But what do you see? Well, you see slight abnormalities in the brain, as a picture A. You see cataract, picture B. You see this rather more obvious speckling in the back of the eye, the retinitis pigmentosa. Defects in, this time, in the basal foot bones and a hearing loss. So many of the same features. But why, what is the difference? What is the similarity between PHARC and Repson? It's a great unanswered question. It's a very rare disorder, so we really don't know quite what's going on. But it's a very interesting that it gives you the same type of outcome. Does it respond to a diet? We don't know. Uh, it looks to a different causation, so we'd expect it to. But there's a lot of things we don't understand here. Next, please. Next slide, please. So that brings me on to treating uh, the syndrome. Because it's caused by an inability to metabolize phytanic acid, it accumulates and causes all the, the damage. So what can you do? Well, you can take it out physically. And that is the role of dialysis for fats. And dialysis for fats can be called plasmapheresis, or specifically for cholesterol-like and part of cholesterol-like protein, where particles where this where phytanic acid dissolves, apheresis. And that we use acutely to take large quantities out, essentially. The problem is that that will take it out acutely, but if you don't stop it getting in in the first place, you are going to actually never quite catch up with the process. And so always you can combine it with a diet, and the level point of diet is to stop it getting in. So the diet basically try and remove all the foods in which phytanic acid is present. Because it dissolves in fats, it generally co maps with use of protein or fats that come from milk and fats that are derived from milk based animals. So herbivore meats some carnivorous fish, salmon being a particular example, and therefore the general advice is to use dairy products. And Eleanor Baldwin and Susan Furman will talk a lot more about the diets in, in another talk. The other thing we can do, which works in a few people but has, uh, doesn't work in everybody, is that we can actually interfere with drugs with fat absorption, and that is a weight loss drug called Ordistat that is not the world's most pleasant stuff to take, but sometimes used as a weight loss drug, and, but it does have the ability to stop fat absorption and therefore as a consequence of that will reduce the amount of phytanic acid in. The other thing that we try and do is that because phytanic acid is stored in various places is that once it's in stores it's not that it's less toxic than if it's circulating around because that's where it seems to be actually acting as an acute nerve poison etc. So Part of this is to stop the fat stores being broken down. And the two main stores of fat are the adipose tissue, the general fat tissue. And secondly, you also have fat, acute fat stores in the liver, which are the fast release fatty acids. And so what we try and do is stop fatty acid release caused by stress or starvation. And that's the metabolic stress management that forms a key part of managing Refson's disease. In the long term, we tend, we tend to use the diet and, and plasmapheresis to varying extents to deplete the absorption. And therefore, as you deplete the levels, then stopping phytanic acid release becomes eventually a bit less critical. And you can actually relax a little bit more on that than you otherwise would. Next, please. So this is an example of uh, apheresis, just showing what happens to a phytanic acid level in micrograms per mil multiply by about six um, to uh, convert to um, 
um, nanomoles per litre, micromoles per, uh, nanomoles, uh, micromoles per litre, and you can see that it, it's taking out peaks quite nicely, but when we get onto the more chronic phase to the right hand side, it's making relatively little difference. And that is why sort of we certainly favour using plasmapheresis acutely for high peaks, but in long, longer term, yes, we use it to manage peaks, but it's not that useful on a longer basis. Suppressing intake is, more, is far more important in our view. Next, please. So where is it found? So just a list from Eleanor Baldwin. So you can see meat products and all these things are, if you have the general features, that they are from herbivores. So they are beef, veal, calves, lamb, mutton, rabbits, goats. Um, all of those are which have ruminant animals and conduce phytanic acid and liberate it and the bacteria in their guts turn it into what's toxic. And that's what we actually want. And there are a number of uh, alternatives. So if you have things that eat grain, like chickens, turkeys, um, tend not to be, and alternatives such as soya products, which don't go anywhere near animals, also are low in phytanic acid. Next, please. So this is just showing what happens in some patients over the years. And this, we started 100%, so these are just to actually rebase a number of val values, because people can be quite variable. They can present with levels as low as 150 to 100 micromolar, or they can present with levels of 5,000. There's huge instant variability. But what we typically see is this pattern of spikes on a decline, and these spikes are general acute deteriorations caused usually by intercurrent illnesses. So getting the flu, going in for an operation, all of those tend to cause these spikes. But as the levels of phytanic acid are gradually depleted by diet and the occasion of that plasmapheresis, you see that some people can get down to levels of almost zero at the end. And we can do that, accomplish that in a third. About a third end up with levels of about tenfold normal, and about a third end up with levels of about twentyfold normal. But compared to the hundredfold or so that they started, it's a great improvement. And that seems to slow down the clinical progression of disease. The eye disease tends to be the one that we can't affect most. That's probably because the phytanic acid is trapped in the nerve components around the eye, and that doesn't seem to recycle very well. It's a little bit better for around the brain, but in the peripheral circulation, which is what the peripheral nerves are exposed to, that's what the livers are exposed to, that's what the skin is exposed to, then you get far faster clearance, and those symptoms tend to resolve quite rapidly, often within about three to six months of actually acutely lowering the phytanic acid level. We used to see when originally, we used to see phytanic acid toxicity to the heart, which is um, an electrically active muscle tissue, and then, but that, responds very, very quickly to a drop in phytanic acid, and we hardly ever see it anymore because this condition is far more recognized and is immediately treated, which wasn't the case 40 or 50 years ago. These days, we see very, very little in the way of heart abnormalities at all, provided that we start treatment promptly. Next, please. This is the kind of levels that you can see. So people coming down, this is called a box and whisker plot. So the line is the average. The box is the range that 95% of people fall in, and you can see the extremes of the whiskers. And you can see that we basically rapidly uh, compress this and move everybody down. And this is pre and post dietary therapy. This is about what happens after about 10 to 15 years in our experience. And it's pretty much been reproduced around the world. So diet and plasmapheresis, in different ways, depending on how different conditions practice, do work in management of this disorder. Next please. The other thing that we can do is, and this was data from the Australian group and David Sullivan at the Prince Albert Hospital in Sydney, showing that just stopping fat absorption can have an effect, and this is a couple of patients that he treats, and data that he published showing that you actually can reduce uh, the amount of phytanic acid just by prescribing this drug. We've tried it in a few people, if you're on a diet that's relatively low in fat, it makes very little difference. Um, people who are on very high diets, quite high in fat, 
for whatever reason, then yes, it does make a difference and does seem to affect phytanic cannabinoids. So it's an adjunct to dietary therapy, but not necessarily useful in everyone. Next, please. So those are the basics of phytanic acid metabolism and how we treat many of the features. The great question in reference to the diet has been, is there any other way that, this, that we could get toxicity from phytanic acid? And this relates back to the idea of what the bacteria are doing in the animal stomach, in the ruminant stomach, where they take phytol, the side chain of chlorophyll, and oxidize it up to the acid, uh, phytanic acid. This process supposedly happens only in animals. In actual fact, work that we've done with Ron Blanders shows that there is a low capacity pathway that does this in humans. And that's led us to go back to the original idea of the diets which excluded any foods that were also high in phytol to see whether those might also be toxic. Because if humans can, create, can convert significant amounts of phytol to phytonic acid, then we have to remove those foods as well. And that's been the great debate. Originally, it was the debate was framed in can people eat any green vegetables at all? And we've gradually relaxed that uh, over the years because most green vegetables aren't a problem. But more recently, we've got more data, and we're now actually beginning to focus more selectively on certain green vegetables that very high phytol contents, and that might be a problem. Next, please. And this is the data that shows where, they, where the phytol contents of some of the foods, and you can see that the phytol content of peanuts, particularly in peanut skins, and that's why we discourage anyone from eating peanuts. Uh, you can see lentils are fairly high. Again, it depends on how they're processed, so it's a matter of actually how much they're skinned as to going for being processed. But various other foods are relatively low. And one of the problems that we found is with things such as rocket, uh, and uh, who work from Germany has also shown green peppers uh, seem to have a relatively high phytol contents and therefore are potentially convertible. So we're beginning to discourage those now. Next, please. So what happens in people with Refson's disease? Why do we actually worry about people with Refson's disease when they get acutely ill? I mentioned that those spikes we were seeing associated with acute illness. And this is a data of an experiment and some what people volunteered to do a number of years ago. This is the effects of a two and a half, two day to two and a half day fast on phytanic acid levels. And on the left hand side, you can see what happens to phytanic acid levels. Generally, people's levels go up. Some people's levels go up a little bit, but other people's levels go up about three or fourfold. And this is within 48 hours. So that, and if that level hits, let's say 1,000 micromolar or 1,500 micromolar, you'll begin to get the acute features of toxicity. That's weakness, that's tingling in the nerves, maybe the skin begins to itch and scale eventually. Those are the kind of features that we see. And that's one of the reasons why we go to great lengths to discourage fasting unless absolutely necessary. And when do people do fast, we try and suppress the fat uh, releasing pathways by giving glucose and dextrose and that's part of the acute management of Refson's disease for clinicians when people are having operations or when they're being ill. So fasting is always a bad idea in Refson's disease. Mm. The other side on this is uh, something called 3 methylmalonic acid and this is a, leads me, will lead me on later to a discussion of omega oxidation because you can see the effects on omega oxidation as well pathways begin to induce and again you see some slight increases in the levels showing that that pathway is now being switched on as the fasting is released uh, and phytonic acid is gone up. Next please. The reason that we say that fasting is dangerous to people with resting disease is that we saw elevations in the five patients we did this in. One patient had an ACE to add and it was fine but three had problems. One was readmitted a week later for generalized weakness, which actually lasted for three months. One got into acute aggressive weight loss, uh, which is unusual in man, but happens in, Refson's, in mice models of Refson's disease, they have an acute weight loss. And one had severe leg cramps for three days. So these are the clinical consequences 
in a controlled experiment where we actually measured all of this. And that's why this experiment will never ever be redone, but gave us a lot of insight into how we can manage Refson's disease acutely when we did it many years ago. Next please. So how can we treat Refson's disease? Well, there are a number of drug therapies that, and approaches that are used in inherited metabolic disorders. One is replacing the enzyme. The problem, and this is well established in inherited metabolic disorders, but the problem here is that you've got to get the enzyme into the right place. It's not just into the bloodstream, but into cells and into the correct place within the cells. That's very difficult. The other thing that we've tried over from other research is exploiting those changes in the structure that the damage the enzyme causes. So we can use slightly different oxygen donor compounds and they're slightly longer or branched. Or yes, it works in cells, but unfortunately not in animals. So that's been a fan. We are looking at part of what the hypothesis mission of DARE is, which is to look at other ways we could possibly treat things. So can we use the omega oxidation pathway to actually metabolize phytanic acid to a different system? Can we deal with the problem directly? Can we replace the enzyme? Because most phytanic acid is, comes in from the diet, we make very little inside the body. If we put it in the liver, and the liver is the first place the food from the gut goes to, we destroy it there by replacing phytanic and uh, hydroxylase, we'll be able to potentially cure the input side thing. The problem is that that might not affect the eyes very much, and so you might need to look at replacing FIH in the eyes and doing a gene therapy for eyes and that's now been tried in other retinal disorders. The other way to replace eye cells is with stem cell therapy and again there are some approaches in other eye and particularly retinitis uh, things some called stargate maculopathy which have been tried with some reasonable with a moderate degree of success so that might actually be a future treatment but uh, Bart Leroy will talk about that more in the ophthalmology talk. Next please. So what is omega oxidation? It's chewing the phytanic acid molecule, not from the acid end, but from the other end. And what you do, as I said, is that you add an oxygen and the hydroxyl group, so you add an acid group on the end, and then you just cut it. And that gives you the 3-methylodipic acid, the 3-MA, and that we can measure in urine as a measure of activity, and we sometimes do that. It's inducible, it's got a moderate capacity, it's naturally present, we know it does something in surge protection, so if we can switch this pathway on, we've got a way of potentially treating the disorder. Next please. This is to show its activity, and we've just done this in a new patient who was admitted. So you can see they originally came at a level of about 3,000 with quite severe disease, so the eye changes, the cataract, long-standing, acute weakness, bed bound, a lot of uh, loss of sensation in the lens. That was the key. And you can see the blue line showing this almost curve of fall off, with initially a high activity, equating to taking out almost about potentially two thirds of the activity, but gradually falling off. And in the red line at the top, the gradual fall of phytanic acid uh, while the patient is being treated in hospital with a mixture of plasmapheresis and diet. So, this is the potential of that pathway shown in, re in, in terms of what it does in an individual. So that's why we think this is, might be a, a therapy. How to do it. Next, please. We know that in animals, this pathway exists. We also know the basis of it in animals. So you can actually knock out the phytanic acid, phytanol K gene in mice, feed them uh, phytanic acid, and they will get certainly the muscle symptoms, they don't get the eye symptoms, but they'll get the weakness and they'll get the heart arrhythmias as well. We know the enzymes that are there, and these are so-called the cytochromes, the 4F pathway. They're certainly present in man, but we don't know what induces them. The problem is that this doesn't seem to be a pathway that's very active in the brain. And when it comes to the uh, gait abnormalities and uh, the staggering that you see in some patients with rare disease, it may not necessarily work there, but if this pathway mostly works in the it might not make that difference. Next, please. 
Lastly, just to show what you can do with, with uh, stem cells, this is a marker from the Stargat uh, model in uh, actually in primates, showing that you can put back these green cells on the right hand side, these bubble like looking cells, and those are the photoreceptors, those are the things that actually uh, enable you to see, those are the light transducers. So it is possible to do stem cell transplant back into the eye to also as a potential therapy. And you might be able to rescue those cells also by gene therapies that previously mentioned. Next, please. So, in conclusion, residues is a rare, it's a partially treatable disorder. We know we can make a difference with the acute toxicity side, that's where it's closing in the, the sensory nerves, the motor nerves, the coordination and the staggering of the disorders and motor nerves cause, the skin part, the eyes, a little bit more difficult, smell we don't seem to affect very much from what we can see, hearing occurs later but may be slowed down by the deterioration may be slowed down by therapy but we're not sure. We've been missing some disorders in the pathway, just simply people haven't been described. The second enzyme in the pathway, there might be some cases out there in the world. If so, no one's written them up and we don't know, but we can guess what they might look like. The signature of Resson's disease is that it's a total knockout of this mutation. There's no partial knockout here. So is there a milder type of it? And if so, what does it look like? We don't know. How do we treat it? Well, we treat it on the classical principles of inherited metabolic disease. So if there's an external toxin, you stop it getting in. And if it gets in, you take it out. So that's the basis of a diet-based restriction therapy and systems like plasmapheresis and apheresis you may be able to increase the metabolism of that, and that's what we'd hope with drug therapies, such as for omega oxidation, or we maybe just deal with the consequences of the disorder by actually replacing the damaged tissue, particularly in the eye, and that's the basis of gene therapy, or retinal gene therapies, or retinal stem cell therapies, or we put the gene therapy into the liver to act as a way of replacing alpha oxidation. So that is where we are in Western disease, it's a brief clinical summary of what this order looks like and how hopefully and how it relates to the treatment and the biology. There's a lot we have learned in the last 20 years, but there's more that we don't know. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony, I think it seems that we've lost Christy. Um, so, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I think I was on mute. I, I uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Susan. So I uh, um, have not. Uh, I for some reason did not have uh, it off mute. But I was I was saying thank you, Tony, for your presentation. Uh, and uh, now we'll move on to the question and answer part of the webinar. We only have five minutes. I'm going to start with a Q&A box and then we have um, a raised hand as well. Um, so and if we have any questions that we're not able to answer, then we'll, we'll ask Tony if he can do a short write-up uh, and we'll post them online as well. So um, all right, let's start. Uh, so I have one question here. Uh, the person who um, provided the response says that their nephew has infantile Refson disease. Uh, and uh, was wondering whether chlorophyll is cooked or in crude vegetables uh, can be transformed at botanic acid. So ultimately, you know, if you cook the vegetables, are you releasing the botanic no. acid? The simple answer to that is no. You need the bacteria to actually ferment the vegetables. So you, sometimes you really actually see botanic acid coming out in fermented foods. So uh, if you cook straightforward vegetables, it's not an issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question, if PA levels are controlled, do, system, do symptoms still deteriorate? Uh, for the peripheral symptoms, like the nerve symptoms, the muscle symptoms, the skin symptoms, those get better and they stay better. The eye deterioration 
seems to slow down, but we don't seem to be able to stop it. Uh, again, with the hearing deterioration, we think we slow it down, but we, again, we're not sure that we stop it, but it might be that natural-based hearing loss with age also begins to play a greater factor, as hearing loss tends to occur in people's in the, in the, in the 50s. So we might be looking at an interplay of factors there. Okay, thank you. Uh, so it says, can you elaborate a bit more on the risk of the heart disease arrhythmia in adult Russian disease and how you treat these? Right. And it used to be very, very common. Um, when we originally used to see people uh, about 20 or 30 years ago, because phytanic acid is toxic to nerve cells and to muscle cells, and the heart cell heart is a mixture of nerve and muscle in the, in its, in it, in the way it acts, you used to see arrhythmias uh, and you see disordered rhythms. And so people used to have very, very funny heart rhythms and that used to be a concern. These days, what we would do is if you come in acutely with Refson's disease and have a very high level, we would normally plasma freeze you, take the levels down very rapidly, and that deals with the problem within pretty much, hour, with pretty much hours or it doesn't occur at all. I haven't seen a case of someone having a heart arrhythmia in Refson's disease for, I've seen one case I think in the last, 10 years. When I started dealing with this disorder about uh, 20 years ago, we used to see maybe one or two cases a year. Diets have changed, the therapy's got a lot more aggressive, people recognize it more, so we don't tend to see. Thank you, Tony. So can you, uh, they want to ask, uh, LDL apheresis, is that better than plasma phoresis? It's equivalent. For taking out uh, phytanic acid, it's pretty much equivalent. Phytanic acid is, does not dissolve very well in water, so it dissolves in fat-based uh, particles, which LDL particles are conversion, and apheresis takes those out. The difference between plasmapheresis and, 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 and apheresis is in plasmapheresis, you have to give back plasma, so uh, plasma components, so it tends to be a lot more, it, it, it tends to introduce a little bit more, bit more bloodstream instability, hemodynamic instability. So we tend to prefer apheresis because it's a slightly gentler procedure. Gotcha. But there's no reason plasmapheresis, but plasmapheresis works quite, quite fine if that's what's available. Okay. Can uh, you tell us the biochemical test for Refsum's disease? How high is pathological? Um, the normal level of uh, phytanic acid in man is six milligrams per deciliter or about 30 micromoles per liter is the top limit. Most people with Refson's disease were their first levels are 500 to up to 5,000. If you have one of the proxome biogenesis disorders levels are typically in the range of two to 300 similar in those, those are the kind of levels we're seeing in AMACR. So above 100 is generally suspicious. Okay, thank you. What, do you. what do you do if despite adhering to all the dietary modifications, the PA levels continue to rise above 600, 800? Uh, it, that's where it gets rather difficult. This is where we actually, this is why we need uh, additional therapies. There is, one, there, there is wide variation in how well people seem to do. One of the things is that, it, that the diet is slow to actually have an effect. Though you'll see an acute fall from about the, the, the couple of thousands range into the hundreds, people, people will plat some people plateau in the five, six hundred range for ages. And sometimes we've found that they have had uh, dietary components they weren't aware of. There have been um, cases where we have found people that have been eating fermented milk products and weren't aware of the phytanic acid load in that, and that might contribute. Um, sometimes we, we go and look for a dietary component there, but eventually it is the balance in every individual between the intake and their ability to oxidize what has, so the omega oxidation pathway that gives the, the final level you achieve. 
And that's all we can do at the moment because we don't simply don't have better therapies. Okay, we have one more question, which I think is also has come from the person who's raised their hand, uh, seems like the same name. So the last question is, will all the symptoms happen if the diet is strictly adhered to from age six or will it eventually happen anyway? Uh, the, from age six, what we would say is none of the peripheral symptoms should, should occur. As I said, the eye changes do occur. We think we slow them down. It's very, very difficult because, to tell because we haven't got the number of people that are treated, not treated, and it's very difficult to actually compare at what rate, how you measure visual deterioration. So the eye changes may progress, but we suspect those will slow down. The peripheral changes will net, will, should not occur. The ones that have occurred to bones, those happen in, in the uterus, those that happen before birth, those are present, we can't do anything about that. Great, uh, I think that uh, ends our questions. Uh, so thank you, Tony, for uh, answering all of those. And I appreciate the attendance and the uh, really great questions from the audience. Uh, I wanted to just touch on that we have some more upcoming REFSM webinars as well that will be held throughout the summer. We um, just added a new one uh, relative to the science behind REFSM where uh, Ronald Wanders and uh, Sacha Ferdinusa will uh, provide a more detailed uh, dive into the science uh, behind REFSM. And then Eleanor Baldwin and Sarah Furman will talk about, a, do a deep dive into our REFSM diet and discussion. That will actually be a, a, a 90 minute session. Uh, um, there, there's a lot of interest in understanding the diet more. And then we'll also hear from Ryan Butler from uh, UT Southwestern on the potential of gene therapy for Refsum's disease. So I think we've got some exciting webinars coming up and I appreciate everybody's uh, time today. Uh, that concludes today's webinar. Uh, thank you very much and have a great day.